Hi all, Chris Weiswapt here. Today I'm going to talk about another medical endoscope root cause investigation. This root cause analysis is a little bit more complicated than the last one, and we'll see the limitations of FTIR analysis and the advantages of moving to gas chromatography for improved detection limits. This photograph shows a latex endoscope sheath. These sheaths are placed on the endoscope during the procedures and they act as a viral and contaminant barrier, allowing the device to be used more rapidly from patient to patient without having to go through high level disinfection after each use. The latex sheath should be this natural brown rubber color the entire length. Instead, we can see there's some regions here where it has discolored black after use. Our goal here is to determine if this color change is a risk to the patients, if it's a risk to any of the devices or the latex sheath, and determine what we can do to help prevent this color change from happening. So I'll admit up front that as soon as I saw that photograph of the black discolored endoscope sheath, I had a strong hunch of what the problem was. I knew from past literature review that orthothalaldehyde disinfectants can react with proteins to turn them brown or black. And this is a natural rubber latex sheath, which potentially has some plant proteins present. The client confirmed that yes, orthothalaldehyde disinfectant was used, but that they'd still like to go through the analysis and figure out what happened. So the materials used included a orthothalaldehyde disinfectant, this natural rubber latex sheath, and two different ultrasound gels that we analyzed by FTIR and gravimetry, just evaporating the water out of them to determine the rough composition. One was a water glycerin mixture, the other was a water glycol and polyacrylate mixture. One important observation is that the black discoloration only occurs in regions of the probe where polyurethane materials are used, so this insertion tube and this acoustic window. Even if you think you know what the problem is, it's often worth doing some testing. As we'll see here, there may be more than one problem, and you'll almost always learn something interesting about the materials you're using. So the client had two main theories of what was going on. They thought that it might be damage to the polyurethanes. Somehow black dye or black pigment was being extracted from the polyurethanes and that's where the black color was coming from. Their other theory was that something was wrong with the ultrasound contact gels and that might be what the problem is. Turns out neither of those were the case. Uh, but this ultrasound contact gel theory is interesting in retrospect. We've seen case reports from the FDA uh, where ultrasound contact gels were contaminated with bacteria growth. I wonder if there's enough bacteria growth where if you mixed in some OPA disinfectant, the contact gel would change color at all. This third theory is that there's something wrong with the batch of latex, and that's what's leading to the discoloration. And then I already mentioned this uh, fourth theory here that the orthothalaldehyde disinfectant is reacting with something to make the black color change. So we have a lot of materials involved here. So we did some variable isolation to see in which cases we'd get the black color change. This first case here, we just have all of the materials in contact with one another and left for 24 hours. The second case here, we have just removed one of the contact gels to see if the color change still happens. Here we've removed the other contact gel to see if the color change still happens. And here we only have the endoscope urethane, the OPA disinfectant, and the latex. And here we just have OPA disinfectant and latex. And here we have all the other uh, materials without the OPA disinfectant. And coming back the next day, we find that there was color change in all of the exposures except for this last one where we didn't have the OPA disinfectant. So this is suggesting that yes, the OPA disinfectant is reacting with something to make the black color happen. Interestingly, when you have just the OPA disinfectant and the latex, sometimes you get a color change, sometimes you don't. So we had to investigate that a bit further. 
So this photograph here shows what happens if you expose the latex sheath to drops of the OPA disinfectant. For some lots of the sheath, you get rapid dark black discoloration. And for other manufacturing lots, you get very light or no black discoloration at all. So we have to answer here, why is the discoloration only happening in some cases? And why does the discoloration only happen in regions that are near the polyurethane device components? So I mentioned I had done a literature review and I'd found that orthothaldehyde or OPA can react with amines or amides proteins to produce dark colored reaction products. Here's a photo from literature of a patient's mouth being stained black after use of an endoscope contaminated with OPA. You can imagine if that latex sheath hadn't been in place, it would have been the patient's tissues being stained black instead of the latex. There are several cases in literature of anaphylaxis or an allergic reaction after exposure to endoscopes contaminated with OPA. And you can find lots of mentions to how low the water solubility is of OPA, which makes rinsing devices after disinfection challenging. There's a couple studies where people disinfected various materials, rinsed the materials, and then put those materials in a petri dish and measured the zone of inhibition, basically the distance from the material in which bacteria wouldn't grow. And that's how they quantified the amount of residual OPA on the materials. And they found that uh, polyurethanes were one of the most difficult materials to rinse OPA from. And that might be why the discoloration only occurs near the polyurethane device components. So even though we already demonstrated that the black staining only occurs when orthothalaldehyde disinfectant is present, we still have a couple questions left to answer. We have to figure out what was the difference between those different lots of sheaths. Why do some stain black and not others? We need to confirm what we think is the answer to why it only happens in the regions where there were polyurethanes used in the device. We think it's because the polyurethane is difficult to rinse. Uh, we need to quantify how difficult that is to rinse and how much OPA is left on the device. And we need to figure out if it's a risk to the patient and a risk to the device. And both of these can be answered by quantifying how much OPA is left in the polyurethane. And then corrective actions can be uh, handled the same way. We need to figure out how long we need to rinse the material in and in what temperature of water to get the OPA out of the device. We're going to turn to two analytical instruments, FTIR spectroscopy, like we used in the last case study. And then we're going to turn to gas chromatography with a flame ion detector. And that'll give us better detection limits and better quantification than we can get from FTIR. Quick review of FTIR or infrared spectroscopy. Molecular bonds and molecules absorb light near their oscillating resonant frequencies. And by looking at peaks in the infrared absorption spectrum, we can identify what types of molecular structures and chemicals are present in a material. I cover this in more detail in my last video. I'll put a link in the description to that video if you want to learn more about FTIR. Some tricky things here that I will mention briefly is that the x-axis here in wave numbers is how many wavelengths fit in a centimeter. So that might be a little bit confusing otherwise. And then we're using ATR or attenuated total reflection sampling mode. The infrared beam comes through a diamond crystal. We press our sample up against the crystal and we're sampling a micron or so into the surface of the material. We're going to start with FTIR analysis from the latex sheaths. We had to do a lot of cleaning on the latex sheath because as received, they were dusted with uh, magnesium carbonate to prevent the latex from sticking to itself. After removing the magnesium carbonate, we can see that the material is essentially a polyisoprene. Here I've shown a synthetic polyisoprene, but the plant-based polyisoprene latex rubber looks very similar by FTIR because the molecular structure is very similar. And here I've shown a plant protein. Uh, these are the amide bands. We can see there's a little bit of an amide signature there, NHOH stretch um, increased relative to the synthetic polyisoprene.
that suggest, yes, this is a natural latex and there is some residual protein present and that could stain black if there was OPA around. Here's that uh, match to the magnesium carbonate dusting powder. So if we look at FTIR results from the latex sheaths that readily stain black and the latex sheaths that do not stain black when exposed to orthothalaldehyde disinfectant, we see one main difference. The black staining sheaths have much higher amide content, NH stretch, suggesting that there's additional plant proteins present in those materials. And that makes sense because the orthothalaldehyde reacting with the proteins is what creates the black discoloration. This is potentially important as plant proteins are also what make people uh, allergic to latex. So if you've watched that previous case study where we were looking at endoscopes that were contaminated with disinfectant, we were able to FTIR the surface after disinfection and see residual uh, disinfectant in the surface of the material. We would like to be able to do the same thing here, uh, but we just don't have the detection limits necessary to see the orthothalaldehyde in the surface of the material before and after they look essentially identical. FTIR, ATR struggles to see composition differences smaller than 1%. Depending on which analyte you're trying to look at, this could be potentially much higher. Some, some materials would be difficult to see at 5% or 10%. Uh, so we need a far more sensitive technique. Uh, just because FTIR did not see anything doesn't mean it's not there. You need to be very wary whenever somebody reports non-detect. You need to think about what their detection limit actually is and is it sufficient. So for our more sensitive technique, we're going to turn to gas chromatography with a flame ion detector. For gas chromatography, your sample typically gets dissolved in a liquid and you inject it into a column. The sample traverses the column. Volatile materials make it through first. Less volatile materials take longer to traverse, so you get to separate all the analytes that are in your sample. And then as they exit the column, they get burned by a flame, and the ions generated by that flame are measured using an ammeter, and that tells you how much material is burning at a given point in time. So you get quantification down into the low PPM levels pretty easily and much more quantitative than FTIR, ATR. I've put a link in the description to both this amazing candle artwork and to this Veritasium video, What's in a Candle Flame, that demonstrates what happens when you have a flame burning in an electric field which is the operating principle behind an FID detector. So we're taught in school that when you combust a hydrocarbon, it reacts with oxygen to form CO2 and water vapor. In reality, it's doing a bit more than that. The flame that we actually see in a candle is a plasma, a bunch of ions. Uh, and those ions in the flame ion detector are collected to a collector electrode that's charged to about 200 volts, and an ammeter measures the current flow through the uh, FID to actually tell you how much material is eluding from the column and burning at a given time. Here I've shown uh, GCFID results for a normal alkane standard, that's the straight alkanes. So here we have octane, nonane, decane, etc. MAP Laboratories has this somewhat unique uh, method of reporting gas chromatography data where we don't just have the retention time here of how long it takes the material to elute from the column, but we also typically mark these um, in-alkane retention times so that you can have a rough idea of the boiling point or volatility and molecular weight of whatever material is eluding from the column. Negligible concentrations of ions are formed when you burn hydrogen or higher oxidation state carbons like carbon disulfide or carbon monoxide. This is why we use hydrogen as our uh, fuel for our FID flame. And this is also why we'll use carbon disulfide sometimes as a solvent for our analyses. Even though carbon disulfide is really hazardous, uh, it has the advantage of not generating a giant solvent peak in the GCFID data. So GCFID offers really good linearity, 
great limits of detection. We can easily get limits of detection down in the PPM levels, uh, but it does not offer much in the way of identification. You can match a retention time, but that's about it. Uh, and that's why it's helpful to have these retention times for the normal alkanes. At least then you can guess at the rough size of the molecule, even if you don't have an exact match for the molecule at a known retention time. We have GC mass spectroscopy if you want to do more identification of these individual compounds as they elute. Here I've taken a section of the endoscope polyurethane tubing given it a standard 12-minute orthothalaldehyde disinfection, rinsed it, and given it a short soak in room temperature water. I then extracted any residual OPA from the polyurethane using methanol and put the methanol into the GCFID. Remember, without a reference retention time, you don't have much identification out of the GCFID. So if we didn't run a reference, we wouldn't know which one of these peaks really was the orthothalaldehyde. Here I've ran a standard at a known concentration, and that allows us to know that this is the orthothalaldehyde eluding here. We measure that concentration at about 15 micrograms per square centimeter. I did not do a second extraction to try and assess whether this first methanol extraction extracted all of the residual OPA. That would be a good follow-up. And another follow-up study would be required to figure out how long you actually do have to soak the material in water of various temperatures to extract all the OPA. And an additional study would also be required to figure out the sensitization limit for how much OPA you can have around before it becomes hazardous to the patient. Here I've shown a logic tree. These can be helpful when you're doing complex failure analyses. To be honest, I don't really ever write these down, but in my head I am keeping track of these. So in order to get that black sheath discoloration, we have to have a latex sheath being used. It has to be a latex batch with high protein content or high amide impurities. Those both have to be true, so we have an and here. I have an or here for or the ultrasound gel could be contaminated with bacteria that could plausibly produce the black discoloration because the proteins in the latex are very similar to the proteins in the bacteria. I haven't evaluated that, but that would be very interesting to check out. And then if we follow to the other side of the tree, all of these other items have to be true as well. So we have to be using a polyurethane or a similar material that's difficult to rinse the OPA from. We have to be using an OPA disinfectant and we have to have insufficient rinsing time of the OPA. If all of those things are true, we end up with black discoloration of the latex sheath. All right, just to review the steps in this analysis, we started out with a photo from the field clinic of a latex sheath that had developed black discoloration after an operation. We reproduced the black discoloration in the lab and showed that some lots of the latex sheath will readily develop a black stain when exposed to orthothalaldehyde or OPA disinfectant, and some lots of the sheaths will not readily develop the black stain. We did a literature review and found several cases where contaminated endoscopes with residual OPA disinfectant either caused anaphylaxis or an allergic reaction in the patient or actually stained their tissues brown or black, similar to this latex sheath. We did FTIR analysis of the sheaths that stained black and the sheaths that did not stain black and found that there was higher protein content in the sheaths that readily developed the black color. And then we did GCFID to show that yes, there is residual orthothalaldehyde in polyurethanes if you don't give them sufficient rinse time after disinfection. And that explained why the black discoloration only happened in sections of the sheath that were in contact or pro close proximity to polyurethane device components. This case study was presented at the AMI Medical Tubing Conference in 2021, and I've since given this talk to a few groups of university students.
one of the most enlightening questions asked by a student was, how long does a study like this take? I think the students are used to academic pacing where a study like this might take several months. And they were a little shocked to find that I spent less than a week on this. I think it would be worthwhile to go through and show the timeline of how the work on this project was accomplished because I spent less time doing this work than I spent making this presentation. I'd estimated this project would take about a week of my time. I got the PO on a Friday and I'd already spent about an hour or so doing literature review and found that uh, orthothalaldehyde can stain proteins black. So I had already done a little bit of work at that point. Monday afternoon, I received the materials, did that initial identification of the materials in the sheath and in the ultrasound gels by FTIR and gravimetry, allowing them to dry and measuring the weight change. And I spent about two hours setting up those uh, initial variable isolation studies to figure out which materials had to be in contact with one another to produce the black discoloration. On Tuesday morning, I came in, took the final weights on those uh, ultrasound gels that I left to dry overnight. And I looked at those variable isolation studies to figure out in which cases the sheaths had stained black. I was a little bit surprised by that uh, lot to lot variation in the sheaths, and I started performing the FTIR analyses to show the higher protein content in one lot than in the other lot, and I repeated that exposure to make sure that that wasn't just a fluke. I then went ahead and just decided to do the OPA disinfection on a piece of that endoscope urethane and do that short rinse and the alcohol extract to see if I could identify the OPA residues in that uh, sheath urethane. I left the GCF ID to run while I went out for lunch and spent the rest of the day answering emails and mulling over the results. Wednesday, I put together a report, which is about four hours more work. So in total, I spent roughly 20 hours actually working on this project. I know some engineering firms that would just do like the initial FTIR investigation of what the ultrasound gels were made out of and what the sheath was made out of. They'd charge you $5,000 or $10,000 for that and then schedule a meeting with a bunch of engineers and you can critically evaluate the data and discuss and figure out what the next steps are. And they could drag a project like this out to several months, get multiple POs, I sh probably should do things that way because I make a lot more money. I just can't bring myself to do it. I, when I'm doing an analysis, I try to be as efficient as possible. I evaluate the data and interpret it as I'm going, which is one of the advantages to doing the analyses yourself. If you had a technician doing this, you wouldn't be able to do that. You'd have to wait till they were done and then review the data. And then you'd have to think about, oh, well, how'd they actually run this? Is it the way I want it? You don't have to worry about that if you just do the analysis yourself and interpret it as you go and decide what the next steps are as you go and start the next experiments as you go. That's how you turn an analysis like this that would otherwise take a month into an analysis that takes a couple days. I just decide what needs to be done as I'm going and do it. Now, as far as advising students on how long a project like this should take and whether or not when they're doing analyses, they should just decide what needs to be done next and go and do it. It kind of depends on the situation. I'm a independent contract analyst. So generally my clients are happy as long as I thoroughly document what I did, thoroughly report what I did. If I can solve the problem in 20 hours instead of two months, they're generally happy about that. But it depends on the work environment. Often you'll find yourself in a much more strict um, cooperative environment where you do the prescribed analyses, you put together a report, you schedule a meeting, and then as a group you review the data and critically assess what needs to be done next. And that'll naturally make a project like this take much longer than it otherwise would. So apologies for the divergence into teaching students and talking about ethics and social engineering. Uh, those are subjects that I do plan to talk about more later.
Um, but yeah, let's get back into the failure analysis. Now, one question that still remains is how long do we need to be rinsing these endoscopes for to get all of the OPA out of the endoscope? I didn't actually run those tests. It would be a really interesting study to take some of the common endoscope materials and do like that uh, literature paper that I mentioned where they measured the uh, zone of inhibition, the distance in a petri dish uh, from which the material and the residual OPA stop bacteria from growing and do a study similar to that, but instead of using a petri dish, actually extract the OPA from the surface of the material and run the gas chromatography to quantify how much OPA was left. It would be interesting to do a study where uh, you take some of the common endoscope materials, give them a standard OPA disinfection cycle, or put them in an automated uh, OPA reprocessing system, and uh, rinse them for zero minutes and quantify how much OPA is left in the material. Rinse them for five minutes, quantify how much OPA is left in the material. Ten minutes, same thing. And then do the same thing at maybe instead of a room temperature soak, try a 30 degree rinse and see if that's hugely advantageous or not. Um, I think that would be a great study and I'd like to see it. And I would imagine that some of these OPA uh, disinfectant manufacturers have that data and uh, as, as well as some of the automated reprocessing companies. Um, they probably have some of that data. Um, I would be interested in doing that analysis either uh, for a client or as a research study. Uh, I may propose that to some of the university students going forward. Uh, the other thing that we could look at is uh, an alcohol wipe, see if that uh, low level alcohol disinfectant wipe uh, is super effective or not at removing that residual OPA. So to answer some more of those initial questions, is the color change mechanism a risk to the patients? Uh, yes, it is uh, potentially a, a risk. With the latex sheath in place, that helps minimize that risk. But if they're giving the endoscopes the same rinse cycle and not using a latex sheath, then all of that OPA is going into the patient, which is bad news. Uh, we don't really know how much of a risk it is. That would be uh, a more in-depth study where you'd need to look at what concentration of OPA is required to cause sensitization issues. Um, and then the other issue that's a risk to the patient is the higher protein content in the latex. Uh, you don't want to use latex, obviously, in somebody that has a history of latex allergies. But anytime you have a latex batch that uh, has an unusually high protein content. So that's just an unnecessary risk and another QA issue. Uh, is the color change mechanism a risk to the reliability of the device components? Uh, we did some separate analyses looking at all the device components, uh, interfaces, et cetera, after uh, OPA exposure, and we did not find appreciable changes. Uh, what can be done to prevent the color change? We already talked about an increased rinse or soak time might be helpful. Uh, increasing the temperature of the rinsed water could be helpful. We haven't evaluated that. And uh, then the alcohol wipe could be much more effective at removing this OPA than uh, water. And those would be great things to evaluate. I've mentioned a lot of references so far in this study. Here's uh, links to some of those literature articles. Uh, a link to a nice paper that describes some of the ions that are generated when you burn hydrocarbons, which is necessary for GCFID operation, and some links to the artwork and that Veritasium video. I hope you enjoyed this presentation, and I hope you learned a little bit about the strengths and weaknesses of FTIR spectroscopy and gas chromatography. I promise in the future I'll upload some more root cause analyses that are not just residual disinfectant in an endoscope, but these two case studies happen to be super simple, super straightforward, which makes them great education tools for talking about the types of uh, analytical instruments we can use and the types of thought processes uh, we can use to do these types of root cause investigations. Thanks for listening, and let me know if you have any questions.